I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this special panel discussion on the murder of Saudi Arabian journalist and public intellectual Jamal Khashoggi uh, and its wider political implications for Saudi Arabia, for the United States, for the Saudi-U.S. relationship, and really for the entire Middle East. In contrast to the canards that have been circulating, suggesting that Khashoggi was really a radical Islamist or some kind of other dangerous or nefarious individual, he was a sober, balanced, and lucid analyst of the politics and development of his country. I want to speak personally now in condemning not only his death, but the grotesque lies and alibis that the government of Saudi Arabia has peddled in a quest to evade responsibility and accountability for this gruesome murder. How the governments, corporations, and societal organizations in the United States, Europe, and other democracies react now and in the months to come whether they allow themselves to be lured by money and power into accepting the fifth, perhaps the sixth or seventh Saudi government story on what happened to Jamal Khashoggi will, I believe, be a defining moment not only for the future of free expression in the region, but for the rule of law globally. Now, one of the things people have been asking me a lot over the past uh, month or so why, and you see it in some of the punditry on TV, why this focus on this one guy? Why only, oh, we got the war in Yemen, we got all these other things. So let me just give a, a little bit of analysis on that. It doesn't mean that if you focus on Jamal, it doesn't mean that the war in Yemen is not also horrific, right? You don't have to pick one or the other. The third and most important reason why this is significant, it's because the United States, if it doesn't demonstrate that there will be consequences for murdering and reportedly dismembering a writer, an intellectual like that, outside its borders or in general, then it will send an unequivocal message to all regimes that the U.S. doesn't care if you murder your journalists and your writers and your dissidents. Of course, there, it's not like some, there were no crackdowns before Mohammed bin Salman. So many writers and dissidents, 30,000 political prisoners, I think Human Rights Watch says, but some that just we have to figure out a way to do justice to Jamal, at least by getting them out of prison. If he was really a reformer, Bahamid bin Salman, why is Raif Badawi, the blogger, still in jail? Or, you know, everybody applauding Mohammed bin Salman for letting women drive. And the, the people who started the movement are in jail. Six women, they're in jail. So here's my bottom line. I feel like if we're really a superpower, we should be able to manage our critical, critically important interests with a very important country of Saudi Arabia at the same time that we are expressing our outrage and holding them accountable for their misdeeds and, and behaviors that we find abhorrent because of our principles. I don't expect President Trump to abandon him, Mohammed bin Salman, and I think it's a very interesting question that reporters should investigate further about why that is. I mean, you know, the president said things like, why should I, you know, why shouldn't I like them? They buy apart, what do you say? They buy apartments for me or they, they, um, you know, and they buy weapons, they buy all those weapons. And, you know, from him, it's clearly a, uh, a financial thing. And also, of course, Jared Kushner, his son-in-law and, and Middle East envoy, who President Trump described as two kids or two young guys, what did he say? Um, but he's the, pres the president's Middle East envoy. So he has uh, interest in maintaining this relationship with Mohammed bin Salman. They're very close. But when President Trump finally got around to saying it's too bad that they that they the cover up was so bad or it was the worst cover up, right? And and you know, people thought that meant that he was getting tough on the Saudis, but in fact it was again like the, the dictators heard if he just hadn't made such a mess out of it, we'd probably be okay with it. I mean there was only one right answer for the President of the United States after this. We condemn this with the full might of the United States and there will be consequences for this. Right. So three options I see, targets, targeted sanctions against Sau certain Saudi individuals, and I don't believe they will include Mohammed bin Salman, suspending some arms sales, cutting off uh, U.S. military logistical cooperation, maybe for the Yemeni war, but I don't know. Now what about corporate leverage? You saw uh, last month um, with the conference, True Investment uh, something initiative, initiative. Um, and there were local venture capitalists from San Francisco who really wanted to go. So I think that it, it's a moment for these two American power centers, the one we're in right here in Silicon Valley, and then maybe like New York, D.C., uh, Congress, to use some of their influence 
um, and think more critically about uh, the investments they make in Saudi Arabia um, and maybe try to use some of that leverage to at least at a minimum not only get accountability and justice for Jamal but get some of these other police, other people released. They need us. Work with. The, we're not going to be able to abandon, you know, cut ties with the Saudis but can we have a relationship that is both works on our interests and also holds them accountable for their misdeeds. That while mainstream international media has portrayed many of these steps as part of um, this broader project to modernize the kingdom. Uh, what we really have here is a project to modernize autocracy in Saudi Arabia, where MBS is alone, unchallenged in the driver's seat. He's alone and he's unchallenged in the driver's seat and there's no one there to hit the brakes. There is no one there to hit the brakes when it comes to his major decisions, however impulsive, however uncalculated. The coverage of Saudi Arabia has largely been driven by this promise of modernity that Mohammed bin Salman is bringing to the kingdom. Uh, and his new vision, uh, and we've all actually like read that um, what I can only describe as like a heartfelt love letter from Tom Friedman to Mohammed bin Salman and his vision in New York Times. That was not a column, that was a love letter. Well, in my opinion, I think the vision 2030 is mainly, first and foremost, a sales pitch. What is it selling? It's selling Mohammed bin Salman to the international community. It's a sales pitch, and if I dare to say, if I dare to say, excuse my French, it's probably what puts the BS in MBS. I'll put this on that note, I'm going to end here. I think it's important to just know that the context for Jamal's uh, assassination is a leadership that is actively fighting free speech, that is openly expressing contempt for dissenting views, and that is just very publicly disparaging journalists and uh, inciting hatred towards them. And I'm not talking about Saudi Arabia here, I'm talking about the United States of America. Uh, I know this is voting day and this is an unpartisan forum, but at some point you just have to call a spade a spade. And you can't expect Washington to act decisively in any meaningful way on issues of personal freedom or uh, human rights on the world stage unless it confronts these issues here uh, domestically. Because I really think that the bare minimum that you would have expected from the administration is uh, an unequivocal, clear and public condemnation of Jamal Khashoggi's uh, murder and that one that holds the highest level level of leadership uh, responsible. I'm not saying come out and say MBS is guilty. Uh, if you want to wait for the investigation, the results of investigation, wait for the results of investigation. But I've seen that movie before and it doesn't go anywhere. But at the very least, say Mohammed bin Salman is the address of the Saudi state, and this happened under his watch, and therefore we hold them we hold him responsible, and there will be consequences. So, but I just like to note that in 2005, for former um, Lebanese Prime Minister was assassinated. Nobody waited for any investigation. The strongest words of condemnation that we got from the President is that this was the worst cover-up in history. The worst cover-up in history. What message does that send? The message that that sends to all the autocrats who are watching and the national security establishments that are watching, get your act together and come up with a better cover-up next time. Because, I mean, I'll have to say this, the Obama administration was not any better. The Obama administration was silent when Saudi Arabia marched into Bahrain and crushed the democracy movement. They didn't utter a word when uh, the war was waged in Yemen. They didn't say anything about Sheikh Nimr and Nimr's uh, execution. They're justifying it, and frankly, the Trump administration is covering, up, covering it up. And if I may say, if I may say, dare they say, again, this is the, this, this is the worst cover-up in history, not what the Saudis have done.